Well, it's good to see you all here tonight. Um, as I was uh, saying before we got started this evening, uh, we had over half of our normal folks not here this morning, so I don't know where they were all at. Maybe some more of them will be here in just a few minutes, but we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm glad you're here. I know we've got some visitors with us, and uh, you're welcome here. We're so glad you're here with us tonight. Um, by way of introduction, I want to just say um, uh, we, we started this series uh, three weeks ago. So tonight is the fourth night of the series of what I had originally intended to be a two-night series, uh, but there's so much information, it's, it was impossible to cover it in two nights. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you before I begin tonight, thank you, brother, before we begin tonight, that uh, tonight and next Sunday evening will be the end of this series. I've looked at it over and over uh, for uh, tonight, and there's no way that I'm going to finish tonight. So tonight will be the next of the last night, and next Sunday night will be the final night of this series. Uh, there's a lot of material, and I don't intend to go back through this series on this subject again anytime soon. And so I want to make sure that we uh, that we present everything that there is that we need to present and that we don't uh, go too fast through anything. I want to present it in a way that will be understandable, a way that will be logical, and so that's why we've done what we've done. So I'll say the same thing that I've said the last three Sunday evenings before I begin the presentation for tonight, and that is that my purpose in presenting this, this, this Bible study on uh, the Bible and Freemasonry is not to throw stones at anyone. It is not to offend anyone. It's not to hurt anyone's feelings because, as I've said every night, I know and probably you know men that are Masons, Freemasons. And almost to a man, the ones that I have known that were Freemasons were good men. But there are things that the Bible says which contradict the things in Freemasonry. And anyone who has a sincere heart, a sincere desire to know what the truth is, uh, they're, they're entitled to see it for themselves. And so the purpose of the presentation is to present it, and uh, folks can see it for themselves, not only you all that are here tonight, but we'll be putting the, the series at some point online as well. So far, we've put the first two weeks of this online, and there have already been over 800 people that have watched the first two uh, installments of this series. And so uh, I trust that both now and in the future, too, those that are watching it, uh, if they watch it with the right spirit, they'll see the information for themselves. And they, with the Holy Spirit's leading, if they're saved, can make a decision for themselves as to what the Bible says and what a Christian ought to do. So having said that, the title of our study has been, Should a Christian Be a Freemason? Now, the first three parts of the series, I don't have time to go back through those tonight, but if you didn't see them, you weren't able to be here, uh, if you'll let me know before you leave tonight, I'll be happy to either text or email you a link to those. You can watch those uh, at your leisure so that you'll see what you missed over the last three weeks. But tonight is part four, and the title, as you see on the screen, is The Secrets That Most Masons Don't Even Know, The Occultic History of Freemasonry. Most Masons know pretty much everything that I have shared with you in the first three weeks. In fact, I would say the vast majority know 99% of what I've shared with you so far. Having said that, though, the vast majority of Masons do not know what I'm going to share with you tonight. Leading into this, we talked about and you saw from their own words, the masters of Freemasonry, their most respected authorities within Freemasonry, that the lower level degrees are intentionally lied to, deceived about what the symbols mean, what the rituals represent, and the history of Freemasonry. And those that are in the three levels of the Blue Lodge, the three degrees of the Blue Lodge, are intentionally led to believe that they understand all the symbols and the rituals. But as we saw from their own words, they are uh, led to believe those things. But the reality is the goal is for them to imagine that they understand 
what those things represent. They're lied to, and a little later on, a little farther in the degrees, they're told, well, what you were told before is not really what it represents. Now that you're a little farther along in your learning and your training, now we're going to tell you what they really mean. And there are a series of lies throughout the degrees, the 32 earned degrees of Freemasonry in the Scottish Rite, and uh, then the advanced degrees of the York Rite as well. But the information you're going to see tonight is information that the average Mason does not know. And if you try to present this information to him, just like Albert Pike said in Morals and Dogma, uh, he, is, uh, he is not going to believe that you know what you're talking about, and you will be hard-pressed to convince him of what you're trying to present to him. So I understand that any Freemason at some point in the future that's watching or listening to this they, they probably are going to say that's just a Baptist preacher that doesn't know a thing what he's talking about. Uh, I am a Mason. I know what it's about. He doesn't know what he's talking about. So my challenge would be to any Freemason at any point in the future that's watching or listening to this to see if the things I present are so. And if you're a Christian, to prayerfully ask uh, the Holy Spirit to show you the truth and he'll do that. So having said that, let's dive into our study for tonight. In Freemasonry, there are greater lights and lesser lights. Masons are told from their initiation into Masonry that there are three great lights in Freemasonry. The Bible, the square, and the compass. The compass is a reminder to walk within the boundaries of morality. That is the circle. And the square is a reminder to the Mason to make sure that all of his actions square with what he knows is right. Remember, the motto of the Masons is making good men better. The Bible, however, is simply a symbol of his faith in God, not in the specific teachings within its pages, because the Quran will be found in Muslim lodges. The Torah will be found in Jewish lodges. The Vedas will be found in Hindu lodges. So then the Bible is considered one of the, quote, pieces of furniture of the lodge, but it is not considered within the lodge itself as the inspired, inerrant Word of God. Now that doesn't mean that there aren't Masons in the lodge that might view it that way, but Freemasonry itself does not teach that the Bible is the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God. Because... In the stead of the Bible, a, a Masonic Lodge could use any of those other religious writings from any other religion instead of the Bible, and that would be perfectly acceptable. And so the Bible is considered a, a piece of the furniture. It's one of the three great lights for what it represents, faith in God. But that doesn't mean that Freemasonry says that everything within the pages of the book itself is the inspired Word of God. Additionally, the Mason is taught that three lamps represent the three lesser lights in Freemasonry. The sun, the moon, and the worshipful master of his lodge. Now what we're about to see is how the, the sun, moon, and stars figure into some of the occultic knowledge in the advanced degrees of Freemasonry. The decorations of the lodge. The trappings and decorations inside a Masonic Lodge are not accidental. Many of them have specific meanings, some hidden and some openly displayed. Note below a typical lodge which features the Masonic altar located in the center of the Grand Room. On the altar are found the three great lights of Freemasonry, that is the Book of Faith, whichever one it happens to be, the square and the compass. The altar is positioned atop a black and white checkerboard symbolizing dualism. And the altar faces the elevated seat of the worshipful master who is always seated to the east. On the walls and or ceiling are symbols of stars, sunbursts, and moons. Now, we talked last week in depth about the ceremonies that go on within the lodge during the actual initiation ceremonies. And we talked about the things that go on during those ceremonies that are overtly religious. We dealt with the irony that some Masons say that the Masonic Lodge is not religious at all, 
and others say, yes, it's a Christian institution. And we show that really the reality is neither of those statements is true when we examine what the actual ceremonies are and the rituals that are performed in each of the first three degrees of the Blue Lodge. But now we're talking really just about the furniture, the, the things that are inside the lodge and on the walls and the ceilings adorning the Masonic Lodge. First of all, there's an altar in the middle, which is an overtly religious uh, object. Uh, but you see that all around it, on the walls, there are stars. You can't see pictured in, in this picture, but there are, in some lodges, you would also find uh, emblems of the sun, emblems of the moon, uh, and certain uh, stars of the zodiac as well. But you see the altar is situated on a black and white checkerboard. Now, in this particular Masonic Lodge, it is a rug that has the pattern of the white and black checkerboard. In some Masonic halls, you'll see a tile floor that is black and white tile, still the same checkerboard, and that checkerboard is to represent dualism, the belief that there's good and evil, and uh, we'll talk more about that as we go through. The sun, the moon, and the stars. The symbols of Freemasonry are intended to represent the sun, moon, and stars, which are but symbols themselves for the pagan gods of Mystery Babylon, which originated at the Tower of Babel. Now, you say, preacher, that's just you saying that. Well, let's see it from their own words. And again, as we talked about, one of the sources that is the most revered in Freemasonry is Albert Pike, the author of Morals and Dogma, which is, to most Masons that I know, they consider that to be the Bible of Freemasonry. But many of them have never even read it. Look what Albert Pike has to say in Morals and Dogma about these symbols in the Lodge. This is not the preacher saying it. This is what Albert Pike says. The mutilation and sufferings of the same sun god, honored in Phrygia under the name of Attis, caused the tragic scenes that were, as we learn from Diodorus Siculus, represented annually in the mysteries of Sibylle, mother of the gods. In Crete, he was called Jupiter Ammon, or the sun in Aries, painted with the attributes of that equinoctial sign, the ram or the lamb. That Ammon, who Martianus Coppola says, is the same as Osiris, Adonai, Adonis, Addis, and the other sun gods had also a tomb and a religious initiation. So what he's saying here is that all of those gods from ancient paganism in the different cultures, they were the same god, and if you read the stories of those gods from culture to culture, the story is the same from one culture to the next. They're all counterfeits for the resurrected Lord that you and I serve out of the Bible. Those stories came around and were in existence before Jesus was ever born in Bethlehem. So preacher, how were they the counterfeits? How was Jesus not the counterfeit? Well, the answer to that, as we've talked about numerous times here at Pinnacle Baptist, is that Satan knew God's plan of redemption all the way back to the Garden of Eden. God told Adam and Eve and the serpent there in the garden that it would be the seed of the woman who would bruise the head of the seed of the serpent. You see, God's plan of salvation was already in place before the foundation of the world, the Bible tells us. Satan has just mimicked and copied God's plan of redemption throughout the ages from one culture to the next. And while the stories uh, have been virtually the same, the names were changed from one culture to the next, but they all include the story of some resurrected God from the dead, usually who uh, is resurrected and becomes one with the sun and is uh, synonymous with whatever sun god that particular culture worships. He goes on to say here that not only are those different gods basically the same as our Jesus, which they're not, but he also says... One of the principal ceremonies of which consisted in clothing the initiate with the skin of a white lamb. And in this we see the origin of the apron of white sheepskin used in masonry. 
We talked a little bit about it already last week. We'll see a little bit about it as we finish up tonight and next week. But the teachings of masonry are that if a person learns to keep the works, the good works taught by Freemasonry, that they can become elevated from the lodge on earth to the celestial lodge. Now, folks, I don't have to tell you any more clearly than that. That's a system of works-based salvation. That if my works are good enough, I'll earn my way into heaven. That might be what Roman Catholicism teaches. That might be what Hinduism teaches. That might be what Islam teaches. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Salvation does not come by our works, but by our grace in the Lord Jesus Christ and His payment for our sin. All of the man-made religions of the world are different than biblical Christianity in that respect. But the reason that the Masons wear the the white aprons is for this reason, because it harkens back to those initiation ceremonies that took place in the ancient mystery religions before Jesus was ever born in Bethlehem. These ancient mystery religions that all had their origins at the Tower of Babel, they all harken back to those things. So the wearing of the The white apron as a symbol of the white lambskin is nothing other than the same thing that the ancient mystery religions used to do with their initiations. And Albert Pike just admitted it. He goes on to say, all these deaths and resurrections, these funeral emblems, these anniversaries of mourning and joy, these cenotaphs raised in different places to the sun god, honored under different names, had but a single object the allegorical narration of the events which happened here below to the light of nature. That's what they're calling these different individuals that were killed and were resurrected and became one with the sun. They're referring to all these individuals in these stories as the light of nature. That sacred fire from which our souls were deemed to emanate, warring with matter and the dark principle resident therein, ever at variance with the principle of good and light poured upon itself by the supreme divinity. So what he's saying is there's the the eternal force of light and the eternal force or principle of darkness. That goes back to the dualism and the white and black checkerboard that we see in all of the lodges on the floors during the ceremonies. But they, as we've seen already, and we'll see more tonight, they've got the story switched around. The God of the Bible is viewed as the evil, malevolent, rule-making God, and the God who is trying to bring enlightenment, open the eyes of the masses of humanity, is the good God. But in actuality, He's the light-bearer. He's Lucifer. And they've got the story switched around. The two characters are the reverse of what our Bible teaches. Well, preacher, I've been in uh, the Masons. I've been in the Masonic Lodge. I know they don't worship Lucifer. They don't worship Satan. Again, let me remind you, the three degrees of the Blue Lodge never hear any of what you're going to hear tonight. You're going to hear a whole lot more, not only tonight, but in the closing week next week. You're going to see from the words of Albert Pike himself... Albert Mackey himself, Manly P. Hall for himself, that the God, in fact, that is at the center of what Freemasonry teaches is not the God of the Bible, but it is the God who opposes the God of the Bible. And you can see in in their own words who that God is as we go along. The all-important Son. In the Indian mysteries... As the candidate made his three circuits, he paused each time he reached the south and said, I copy the example of the sun and follow his beneficent course. Blue masonry has retained the circuits, that is the three degrees, but has utterly lost the explanation, which is that in the mysteries, the candidate represented the sun. Now this is Albert Pike talking. He's talking about in the, in the first three degrees and in the ancient Indian mystery religions, the initiate represented the sun as he moved in a circuit during some of the 
ceremonies, the rituals within the lodge. Descending southward toward the reign of the evil principle, Aramon, Seba, or Typhon, darkness and winter. There, figuratively, to be slain, and after a few days to rise again from the dead and commence to ascend northward. So here you see uh, uh, one of the um, equidistant maps of the earth, and you see how the sun makes its circuit uh, going out towards the outer edge of the earth and the, the South Pole, what's referred to as the South Pole, and that's winter time. And then he begins to make his way back towards the center, which Albert Pike says is the, uh, the, the summer months. He goes on to say, uh, or Albert Mackey says in his lexicon of Freemasonry, the blazing star constitutes one of the ornaments of the lodge. Dr. Hemming, quoted by Oliver, says it refers to the sun, which enlightens the earth with its refulgent rays, dispensing its blessings to mankind at large, and giving light and life to all things below. Remember in Freemasonry, it's all about a search for light. And that light is just a word for knowledge, wisdom, understanding that the average person is said not to have. But that light that Freemasonry offers is not the same light in, as in the Bible. Those in the first three degrees are told that's where the light emanates if they're in a Christian lodge, but they're not told that if they're in a Hindu lodge or a Buddhist lodge. It depends on what lodge they're in as to where the source of that light is in the first three degrees. But the further they go up in the hierarchy of masonry and the more advanced their degrees become, they begin to learn that the light in fact has nothing to do with the Bible and in fact it has something to do with a secret knowledge that the Bible is just a veiled shell of. There's something more than that. There's something behind those things. Sun worship. Everything in Freemasonry at the upper level degrees goes back to the worship of the sun, the adoration of the sun. And I say that because those that have been here at Pinnacle Baptist for any amount of time, and we've talked about Mystery Babylon in the book of Revelation and at the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11, those ancient religions all made the worship of the sun the central focus of, of every pagan religion in the ancient world. And it still goes on today in various ways, even in our own culture. But follow me along uh, with our study into Freemasonry and sun worship. The Freemason sun worship is based upon the pagan fertility religions of male and female union and upon the pagan belief that God is hermaphroditic, uh, hermaphroditic, that is being both male and female. The pagans believed and still teach today and the occult and witchcraft and Wicca and Freemason, uh, Freemasonry all teach that uh, the God that is revealed is both male and female. Dualism. The two parts. And the two parts are essential to make the complete God. What you're going to see for the next few slides in this presentation are that it is all about the fertility religions of the ancient pagans. The union of male and female. The union of, I, we're not going to be graphic, but the union of male and female reproductive organs because all of the ancient mystery religions were all about SEX and fertility in the worship of their gods and goddesses. The symbols of Freemasonry are intentionally a recreation of the symbols of those ancient pagan fertility religions. Albert Mackey in 1882 writes, Elsewhere I have very fully alluded to the prevailing sentiment among the ancients that the supreme deity was bisexual or hermaphrodite, including in the essence of his being the male and female principle the generative and prolific powers of nature. This was a universal doctrine in all the ancient religions. So this is not the Baptist preacher saying this. 
This is one of the masters of Freemasonry saying this. He's agreeing with what the Baptist preacher says. From which symbols the Masonic point within a circle is a legitimate derivation. They all taught that God, the Creator, was both male and female. Preacher, you don't know what you're talking about. The Masons don't have anything to do with uh, fertility worship and male and female. I'm sorry, this is one of the leading authorities of Freemasonry that we were introduced to the second week of the study. The point within a circle, if you ask any Mason what are some of the most common symbols associated with their craft, they will tell you the point within a circle is one of the symbols of Freemasonry. I'll also mention, most Masons may not know this, but the point within a circle is also one of the most powerful symbols in witchcraft as well. Let's continue what Albert Mackey says. This hermaphrodism of the supreme divinity was again supposed to be represented by the sun, which was the male generative energy, he's the dot, and by nature or the universe, which was the female prolific principle, that is, around the sun. And this union was symbolized in different ways, but principally by the point within the circle. The point indicating the sun and the circle of the universe, invigorated and fertilized by His generative rays. Those that are members of our church, when we talked about Mystery Babylon and going back to the Tower of Babel, you remember the, the story of Nimrod, who was cut in pieces, his wife Semiramis put his body pieces back together and then uh, put a candle in place of the one part she couldn't find, lit it, and he supposedly was resurrected from the dead and ascended up to the sun and became one with the sun. Then when she walked out the next day, the rays from the sun, the new sun god, beating down upon her, supposedly caused her to become with child. And nine months later, she bore their son, which in the Bible, his name is Tammuz. He's called by many different names in the ancient pagan religions, but it's the same three characters, the same story over and over again in every pagan culture of the ancient world. Albert Mackey says the same thing. Finally, he finishing says, So far then, we arrive at the true interpretation. Now, this is the 33rd degree that wrote, wrote the explanation for all the other 32 degree Freemasons to understand. He says, We arrive at the true interpretation of the Masonic symbolism of the point within the circle. It is the same thing, but under a different form. As the master and wardens of a lodge. The master and wardens are symbols of the sun. The lodge of the universe or world, just as the point is the symbol of the same sun and the surrounding circle of the universe. So he says, the worshipful master of the lodge is the point. The lodge around him is the circle. Just as in ancient pagan religions, the sun was the point and the universe around the sun was the circle. Male and female. The point within the circle. And I'm going to tell you, you can tell however many masons you want to that that's what the point within a circle means and they will probably call you a liar, say you're misinformed, you don't know what you're talking about, but this is one of the authorities of Freemasonry telling you what the point within the circle means. It is a recreation of the ancient pagan fertility religions. By the way, Mackey's not the only one who says this. Albert Pike says that. Manly P. Hall says that. And uh, Henry Cole says that as well. Some more about Freemasonry and sun worship. Freemasonry teaches the sun worship of heliocentrism and modern science that involve the earth spinning and whirling along around the sun. The sun is the center of everything. That belief that the sun is the center of the universe, or at least of our solar system, did not come into existence until 500 years ago with Copernicus. It's antithetical to the Bible. The Bible does not teach heliocentrism. The Bible teaches geocentrism, that the earth is the center of God's universe, that He made for mankind. A preacher, uh, that goes totally against NASA 
and what all the modern day science says. I know that. I don't know about you, but I'm going to stick with the Bible. But the Freemasons 500 years ago and for the last 500 years have been some of the leaders in academia, entertainment, and government pushing the, the belief in heliocentrism, that the sun is the center of everything. Freemasons and Jesuits are the two groups that are responsible for changing the world into a heliocentrism worshiping world. For countless ages, a fragment clings to its sun, according to the Kentucky Monitor, which is one of the official publications of the Masons. A world in preparation. Eventually it is thrown whirling into space to begin a separate existence. The birth of a world. The gases solidify, land and water appear, the period of development. So they're saying the same thing that evolutionists say, that the earth was spun off of the sun and eventually cooled down and hardened and became the planet earth just like the other quote unquote planets that they say revolve around the sun they're saying the same thing the evolutionists say that's not what the bible says in fact the bible teaches and this isn't a study tonight on biblical cosmology we've got another series on that you can listen to if you want to but the bible clearly teaches that the earth was created on day one of creation in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The heaven and the earth. It was not until day four that God made the sun, the moon, and the stars. How was the earth spun off the sun when the sun didn't exist until day four? And how was the, sun, the earth whirling around something that didn't exist until day four? You see, you either have to believe the Bible or you can believe modern science. Freemasonry has been pushing an unbiblical view of science for the last 500 years. What does the Bible say about worshiping the host of heaven? Now, I'm going to run quickly through this because I need to make better time than I'm making. The Bible records numerous instances of the worship of the host of heaven. It is always associated with the worship of Baal, the sun god, and Ashtaroth, the moon goddess, who's also referred to in the book of Jeremiah as the queen of heaven. Here's 2 Kings 17, 16. And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God, this is the people of Israel, and made them molten images, even two calves, and made a grove and worshipped all the host of heaven and served Baal. That is telling us that the children of Israel at a time worshipped the sun, the moon, and the stars just like the pagans around them did. Look what the Bible says in 2 Kings 21, verses 3 through 5. Uh, again, it says uh, that he, the, the current king tore down the altars of the Lord and built altars to Baal. It says, uh, and worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. Look down to the, the last one here, 2 Kings 23, verse 45. Uh, it says that uh, they worshipped... They made vessels that were made for Baal and the grove and for all the hosts of heaven. And the king Hezekiah had them destroyed, torn down. But the last part of that says, Them also that burned incense unto Baal, to the sun, and to the moon, and to the planets, and to all the hosts of heaven. So even the children of Israel were involved at one point with the worship of the sun, the moon, and the stars like the pagans around them. So why is Freemasonry involved in the same veneration of the sun, moon, and the stars that all the pagan religions were? Well, you're about to find out a little more why tonight and next week. Here's more of the point within a circle. One of the more common symbols in Freemasonry is the point within a circle. Like all other Masonic symbols, Masons of the lower degrees are given noble meanings behind the symbol. That is, they're lied to and they're told this is what the point within a circle means. Here are some of the things I've, I've heard Masons tell me that the point within a circle means. Number one, the circle represents the line which separates the lusts, vices, and passions of the individual Mason from his fellow man whom he serves. Number two, the circle represents the boundary within which the individual Mason, the point, lives in duty to God, his brother Masons, and fellow mankind. He walks within boundaries. Number three, the circle represents the circular walk of the mason around the sacred altar 
which is not the one in his local church, it's the one in the Masonic Lodge, around the sacred altar, the point, which lies inside, inside of the Masonic Lodge. But just as with all other Masonic symbols, those of the higher degrees learned that the earlier explanations of the symbol were just a lie to cloak the true esoteric or hidden meaning. Albert Mackey explains it thusly. This emblem is to be found in every well-regulated lodge and is explained as representing the point, the individual brother, and the circle, the boundary line of his duty. So Albert Mackey says that's what all the lower level degree initiates are told it represents. But that this was not always its symbolic signification. We may collect from the true history of its connections with the phallus of the ancient mysteries the male generative principle. He's telling us that the true meaning of the point is that it is the symbol of the male and the circle is the symbol of the female. So here's Albert Mackey again who wrote the explanation that is used in perhaps the majority of lodges around us to explain what the symbolism is of the point within a circle. It is nothing but an ancient pagan fertility symbol of the male within the female. The fertility symbol of the ancient pagan religions. What, what do modern day Christian masons have what business do they have being associated with something related to this when the leaders of Freemasonry are saying this is what it means? Well, that's not what we teach at our lodge. Pull, pull his book off the shelf next time you go to the lodge. His book is in your lodge, I'll guarantee you. Albert Mackey, Albert Pike, Manly P. Hall, their books are all there in the library. The Point Within a Circle and Mystery Babylon. All of the symbols of Freemasonry are occultic, that is, hidden. Symbols of the ancient mystery religions, which all emanated from the Tower of Babel, when God scattered them throughout the earth. All these pagan religions were fertility religions, which symbolized the false religion of Nimrod and his wife Semiramis. And when God scattered everybody at the Tower of Babel, not only did they all go their separate ways with the different tongues that God confounded there at the Tower, but they also all left with the same false religion that they were practicing at the Tower of Babel. That's why you say, find the same false worship of the sun, the moon, and the stars everywhere around the earth, even on different continents after the Tower of Babel. With the sun being the male father deity and the moon being expressed as the female mother deity deity. One of the iterations of this pagan worship is found throughout the Old Testament in the worship of Baal. How many of you ever remember reading about the worship of Baal in the Old Testament? Remember Elijah went up on top of Mount Carmel and prayed fire down from heaven while the prophets of Baal were, were cutting themselves praying to their god Baal? And there are many other stories about the worship of Baal in the Old Testament. Over 40 times we find the worship of the god Baal involving an altar surrounded by a grove of trees which symbolize the worship of the goddess Ashtaroth or Asherah. So anytime in the Bible when you find the worship of Baal, at least 40 of those times, you find the worship of Baal represented by an altar. And around that altar was a grove of trees representing the worship of Ashtaroth, the moon goddess. It's the same story of Nimrod and Semiramis. The altar inside the grove was literally a point within a circle. The point is the symbol of the male. The circle is the symbol of the female. So here's where the square and compass come in. Easily the most recognizable symbol of Freemasonry today is the square and compass joined together. Just as with the point and circle, all other Masonic symbols... The average Mason has been lied to about this symbol. He thinks it symbolizes a noble virtue. And I promise you, every Mason you know thinks the square and compass symbolizes leading a virtuous, noble life. All the Masons I know think that's what it symbolizes. You're about to see what the, the head honchos of Freemasonry say. George Lilly says, The meaning behind it is quite literal. 
with the square representing morality and that Freemasons need to square their actions by the square of virtue with all mankind. The compass then measures the ability to wisely conduct actions within certain boundaries. Now that's the definition most Masons are told. But let's see what it really represents. The reality, however, is that this symbol, just like the point in a circle, is intended to symbolize the religion of Babel, the male and the female. In Morals and Dogma, Albert Pike wrote on page 850, the hand on the male side holds the compass, and that on the female side, a square. In other words, it is the male inserted into the female. It's a symbol of fertility, reproduction, that was part of the religious worship of all of the ancient mystery religions. All of these symbols are pictures of the wicked immoral worship surrounding mystery Babylon and the glorification of fertility, and that includes the worship of Baal, Osiris and Iris and, and Isis in Egypt, and on and on we could go with the different gods and goddesses. So here's a little bit of history about Freemasonry. The first third party in America... Founded in 1828, the Anti-Masonic Party was the very first third party in American politics. Bet you didn't know that. It's not well known, not talked about today. Uh, you won't see it on CNN or Fox, by the way. But there was an Anti-Masonic Party started in 1828. Originally, it was founded upon one lone issue, ridding America of the influence of the Freemasons. The anti-Masons purported that Masons posed a threat to government, to American republicanism, by secretly trying to control the government. Furthermore, there was a strong fear that Masonry was hostile to Christianity. Now, this wasn't in the 21st century. This wasn't after the year 2000. This isn't modern conspiracy theorists. This is 1828. Why do you suppose Americans in 1828 already believed that the Masons were trying to get into the most powerful seats of government in every state and in the federal government? And why do you suppose in 1828 Christians were concerned that the teachings of Freemasonry were increasingly anti-Christian? Well, because of everything you've just seen and a whole lot more you haven't seen yet. Why were so many Christians worried? What did they know, and were they right to be concerned? I can't play this because it won't play on my phone here. This is a, uh, one of the speeches that JFK gave as president just before he was assassinated, in which he talks about how Americans uh, find repugnant secret societies. Uh, that's just a short excerpt from one of his final speeches. I don't have any way to play it for you, so... You'll have to look it up for yourself. Ladies and gentlemen. Oh, there it is. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweigh the dangers which are cited to justify it. Now, he was on the face in that speech talking about communism. But this speech is one of the reasons he ended up being assassinated by those who were in the club in Washington, D.C. Because he understood there is a secret club with oaths that they take in private that is behind much of what was going on in Washington at the time and is still going on today. He understood that. One of the last official acts he made was to begin dismantling the CIA and he said he was going to bust it into a million pieces. Shortly after that, he ended up with uh, the back of his head missing. He was on to something. Here's some history on the Masons. The original Masons, the operative Masons of the Middle Ages, were actually working with brick, stone, and mortar, but they carefully guarded the secrets of their craft, that is, stone craft, 
for business reasons. In other words, they didn't want just anybody knowing how they built buildings correctly because that's how they made their livelihood. Their guilds or lodge meetings were not open to the public, and in time they became places for the men of the guilds not only to discuss their craft, but to relax, engage in amusements, checkers or chess or whatever, and discuss the affairs of the day. Now those were the original masons that were actual stone masons. In time, the lodges of the operative masons, though, became open to speculative masons, men who were not actual stone masons, to join who although they did not share in the craft of stonemasonry, they were nevertheless interested in a club of men where they could relax, discuss current events, and engage in a fraternal organization to help promote one another in the business world. Those are the Freemasons of today. They're not operative Masons. Most of the Masons that you'll meet uh, have never built anything out of stone or brick in their lives unless it was a barbecue in the backyard. Uh, masons today are Freemasons. They are not stonemasons whatsoever. The one evolved into the other, as we talked a little bit about on night one. Enter the alchemists. Alchemy is the pseudoscience which purports to be about the study of turning base metals such as lead into precious metals such as gold and silver. The alchemists of the Middle Ages and the Renaissance period used the cover of alchemy for other purposes. That is, there were men who claimed that they had discovered how to turn lead into gold. They were liars, but they were after something else. When it comes right down to it, you're about to find out what. They were hucksters and liars. The original alchemist, including the Knights Templar, who had returned from the Holy Land Crusades, never succeeded in turning lead into gold in the laboratory. But what they did succeed in doing was learning how to move money from other men's pockets to their own in such fanciful ways as, one, claiming to have discovered religious relics in the Holy Land that held supernatural powers, which they were willing, of course, to sell for the right price. And these included the Holy Grail, uh, which was supposedly the last cup from which Jesus drank at the Last Supper with the disciples, and the Spear of Destiny, which was supposedly the spear used by the Roman centurion to thrust into Jesus' side as He hung on the cross, and it, of course, would have come in contact with uh, Jesus' uh, blood as well. So there have been many of those supposedly found over the last 2,000 to 3,000 years that have been sold to people who thought they were buying the real thing, but they were just being taken uh, to the cleaners. There are also, one of their ways of performing this magic trick was claiming to have learned special knowledge about such mythical things as turning lead into gold or finding the secret of eternal youth, which they were also willing to sell for the right price, especially to wealthy patrons and kings and queens. These men were no different than Joseph Smith, who started Mormonism, who claimed to be able to divine the location of gold and silver in the ground as a money digger before he concocted the story of finding the, quote, lost tablets of Mormonism and creating his own religion. I don't know if you know that part of Joseph Smith's story, but he was what was called by the locals a, a, a money digger. He claimed he had a divining rod that he could use to find gold and silver buried under the ground. And if you'd pay him the right amount of money, why, he would go and find it on your property. That's one of the reasons he was run out of upstate New York, but not by any means the only reason. A deal with the devil. The early alchemists learned that money leads to power. And the more money one has, the more power he has. Anybody believe that's true today? Anybody know who Bill Gates is? Yeah, okay. These alchemists honed their skills and discovered early on that if they were willing to sell their souls to the devil, there was no limit to the amount of money and power they could have. But these are not Christian people. They're at best Roman Catholic, but they're not Christian. Those willing to make this deal with the devil were no different than those before the flood of Noah who willingly associated with the fallen angels in order to gain special knowledge in many areas. And if you want to read that story, go back and read Genesis chapter 4 where it talks about the descendants of Cain, such as Tubal-Cain, 
the father of those who work in metallurgy, Jubal, the father of those who make music, and Jabal, the father of those who raise cattle and could be considered the first millionaire among men. Not too surprisingly, the names of all three of these illuminated or special knowledge ones come from the ungodly line of Cain and they're part of the stories enshrined in Freemasonry and its symbols. Have you ever wondered, if you know anything about Masonry, why are the descendants of Cain so prominently featured in the myths of Freemasonry? I mean, that's the ungodly line before the flood. The ungodly line of Cain. Well, it's because those were the individuals who cavorted with fallen angels to gain whatever special knowledge they could, to gain special advantage in human society. And by the way, Satan is still making those kind of deals with people today. You can make a list of the top ten Hollywood stars and the top ten pop singer stars, and you'll find the same deal being made today, right along with a lot of those sitting in Washington. Tubal Cain. There's one of the famous symbols in Freemasonry. It's known in Freemasonry as the symbol of Tubal Cain, who was involved in metallurgy. What does that have to do with Freemasonry? Well, it's what's behind the story of Tubal Cain that is at heart in the mythology. Turning lead into gold. For those alchemists who are willing to sell their souls, they learn that, in fact, it is possible to turn lead into gold. So, sorry, I lied to you a little while ago like the Masons do. It is possible to turn lead into gold. Bet you didn't know that. I'm about to show you how that's possible. The former alchemists, including some who worked within the trade guilds of the Middle Ages, formed the early banks in Europe and discovered how to create money out of thin air through something that we today know as fractional reserve banking. That is, if you take $100 and put it in my bank, I'm then going to loan out $100 to him, $100 to him, $100 to him. Even though I only had $100, I loaned out $100 to three different men. And when they all pay me back, guess who has the most money? I do. Realizing that central governments, that is national governments, possessed an almost unlimited supply of wealth from the citizenry that they taxed, the bankers eventually began to be more interested in loaning money to kings and queens than to common people. I would much rather loan money to the king and queen than to you. Number one, you don't have as much and you don't need as much and you're not going to pay me as much back. Number two, I've got a guaranteed uh, promise it's going to get paid back if it's the king that borrows the money from me because if he doesn't have the money when it comes time to pay me back, he's going to go to you and collect it and pay me my money. So the bankers began to loan out their money to kings and queens more so than just average individuals. Thus were born the central banks of Europe which were owned by the house of Rothschild. And I don't know if you know this or not, this is not a story about the Rothschilds tonight, but the Rothschild family is a sinful, evil, wicked, satanic family. And when they started their central banks, they had a bank in Germany, a bank in England, a bank in France, and a bank in a number of countries, and they are the ones behind all of what was going on in international politics. Also realizing that governments of countries which were stable and at peace had very little need to borrow any money, the now international bankers began the practice of starting wars so that they could then loan money at extravagant rates of interest to both sides involved in the conflict. There are very interesting stories you can read of how the House of Rothschild and their central banks in London and Paris started numerous wars between England and France so they could loan money to both sides to finance the war effort. And the Rothschilds are the ones that made the money. Preacher, how, how does this tie into Freemasonry? I'm getting there. Don't lose me. If you, if you don't see the connection, you'll never understand what the whole change of masonry has been about for the last several hundred years. Thus, they literally had learned the art of turning lead, bullets, into gold. And they still do that today, by the way. What is Illuminism? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 11, 14, and 15, and no marvel, 
For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. By the way, I have a specific place where I'm going uh, before I stop tonight, so hold on for just a minute. getting close, but I've probably got another 15 minutes tonight. So if you need to head out early, you're welcome to go. If you miss it, you won't ever hear it again because this is my only time going through here. I hope you're able to stay. Illuminism is the name for the doctrine of seeking light or hidden knowledge from Lucifer, who is the light bearer. That's what the name Lucifer means. Which term is preferred by those who have sold their souls to the devil? That is Illuminism. Those who are following Satan and seeking this special illumination, they prefer the name Illuminism. They're not going to call it Satanism. You and I would call it Satanism. They're going to call it Illuminism. It's what the Illuminati or the real Illuminati stands for. Illuminism is also referred to secretly by the adepts in the craft as Luciferianism, but it is really just an occultic term for old-fashioned Satanism. When we see some of the writings we're going to see next week, the masters of Freemasonry refer to it as Illuminism and Luciferianism. It's what you and I would call Satanism. It's one and the same. They just want to make it sound a little better, so they're going to wrap it up in a little better packaging, but they call it Luciferianism, Illuminism. This pagan quest for more light underlies the rituals of Freemasonry's allegory of seeking more light from the east, which is the direction, of course, of the rising sun. I'm moving quickly. The spread of Illuminism. The Order of the Illuminati was formed in Bavaria on May 1st, 1776, which is May Day. It's, uh, it's an ancient pagan celebration. It was the celebration of Beltane in Ireland and Scotland. It was known by other names in other countries. It's the name of a pagan festival uh, that was celebrated every year in the ancient pagan religions all around the world. It was started by Adam Vieshop, the Jesuit university professor in Bavaria. While it remains undocumented, it is widely believed that Baron von Rothschild was the mastermind and financial backer of the order. The Illuminati membership intentionally sought to infiltrate the lodges of Freemasonry. So what I'm saying is before this happened, there were Freemason lodges, but they were not teaching the same things that Freemason lodges are teaching today. In Prussia, Bavaria, Poland, and beyond, in order to influence politics and finance at both the national and international level. Notice there's a particular family that's behind this and the international banking. It was eventually declared to be outlawed in Bavaria, that is the order of the Illuminati, due to the revolutionary anti-government ideas, and its members were banished from Bavaria. Several influential members of the Illuminati and its ideas found their way to the, the lodge of the Grand Orient in Paris, France, from whence the Illuminati fomented the revolution of the Jacobins and the French Revolution itself, seeking to overthrow the established order and Christianity and replace it with atheistic humanism and reason. The worship of reason, the goddess of reason, was elevated during the French Revolution by the Jacobins, who not only decapitated the the royalty there, but they sought to do away with anything related to the Bible in France during the French Revolution. That's for another whole... Uh, message some other time. They even did away with the seven-day calendar week uh, because they were in such rebellion to God. They adopted a 10-day week based on the metric system, but they soon found that God didn't make our bodies to work on a 10-day week with nine days of work and a day of rest. God made it to work on six days of work and a day of rest, and both the men and beasts of France started uh, coming down with diseases of all kind because of it. It is this revolutionary doctrine of Illuminism of which George Washington expressed his concern 
about the possible infiltration of the lodges and government in these United States. You mean George Washington was warning about the Illuminati when he was around? He sure was. What is the doctrine of Illuminism? Illuminism is the occultic search for special hidden knowledge that the average man does not know. It's the belief of those searching for this knowledge that it holds the key to every success. Wealth, fame, fortune, power, and eternal life. Just a few of the occultic symbols for this search for light are a torch, a bolt of lightning, a serpent, a tree with forbidden fruit. And these symbols can be seen everywhere around us today. Here are just a couple of examples down at the bottom of this slide. There's the, the eternal flame of the Olympics that never goes out. It's an ancient pagan symbol of illumination. Here is a, a scene from one of the Marvel superhero movies with the eternal flame as well. Back up to our reading. Lucifer is the light bearer who seeks to introduce to this uh, introduce man to this hidden knowledge just as he did with Eve in the garden. He presents Jehovah of the Bible as an evil malignant creator who is selfish and narcissistic. Through ancient times before and after the flood he sought to encourage within mankind the same rebellion against God that he did in the garden. To those who do not wish to be accountable to a holy righteous God Lucifer is the good guy and Jehovah is the bad guy. I mentioned this last week in passing. There was a movie Russell Crowe did uh, over 10 years ago, supposedly the story of Noah. But in that story, the characters are the exact opposite of the way they are in the Bible. The God who is bringing the worldwide flood is portrayed as the bad guy of the movie. And the fallen angels who are helping the masses of humanity try to escape the flood, they're the good guys in the story. That's kind of backwards from what our Bible teaches, I believe. The pagan mystery religions became Satan's tool for continuing and promulgating the rebellion against God after the Tower of Babel and the dispersion of mankind around the earth. But they all took with them everywhere they went from the Tower of Babel this false religion. This rebellion included the worship of the many false gods of antiquity and also the initiation of select followers into the various mystery religions which included secret membership, secret rituals, and supposed secret knowledge for those in leadership positions within those mystery religions. Sound similar to anything we're talking about tonight? Those initiated into the various mystery schools viewed themselves as more, quote, enlightened than the rest of us. They viewed themselves as the keepers of the eternal flame of wisdom. This worship of knowledge, wisdom, and reason was the basis for the Enlightenment period of Western history and resulted in the Jacobins of the French Revolution who sought to replace the worship of God with the goddess of reason. These Jacobins formed the origin of early socialism, communism, and Marxism, which quickly spread like a disease throughout the world. They discovered that the safest and most effective instrument through which they could spread their pernicious doctrine was by infiltrating the lodges of Masons and changing them, the Masonic lodges, into temples of Illuminism from within. So what we're saying is that those following Illuminism intentionally infiltrated Freemasonry and changed Freemasonry into something different, which is what it is today. The Masonic lodges were the perfect tool. They were limited exclusively to members who were bound by oaths to keep secret the business of the lodge. And over time, the occultic doctrines were woven into the rites and rituals of the Masons. By encouraging members to help fellow members outside the lodge, the lodges of Freemasonry provided an exclusive club for securing positions of power, wealth, and authority in the halls of business, industry, government, religion, and academia for members willing to promote the cause of Illuminism and each other. This is the reason that although the number of Masons is relatively small in comparison to the general population, they hold a huge disproportionate percentage of influential positions in every walk of life. Why? Because when they get into a place of power, they promote their own kind that are also part of the club. I'm almost finished. Don't give up on me. 
George Washington the Mason. It is always touted by Masons that President George Washington himself, the father of our country, was a Mason. And it is true. Was Freemasonry in America different in Washington's day? If so, what was the difference? And what radically changed Freemasonry to what it has become today? Well, here's a letter uh, from George Washington to a man writing to him about whether he understood the dangers of Illuminism coming into these United States way back in 1798. George Washington begins his letter, Sir, many apologies are due to you for not acknowledging the receipt of your, uh, your obliging favor of the 22nd. And uh, he goes on to say, as you see highlighted, I have heard much of the nefarious and dangerous plan and doctrines of the Illuminati, but never saw the book you were talking about until you were pleased to send it to me. The same causes which have pre prevented me acknowledging the receipt of your letter have prevented my reading the book, namely the multiplicity of matters. He said, you, I appreciate the book you sent me. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I've heard of these dangerous people and doctrines. Look at the bold down below. The fact is, I preside over none Masonic lodges, nor have I been in one more than once or twice within the last 30 years. So all the Masons that go on and on about George Washington being a Mason, he just said for himself he was only in a Masonic lodge once or twice in the last 30 years of his life. He, he was not an active Mason, but let's see what else he has to say. I believe, notwithstanding that none of the lodges in this country are contaminated with the principles ascribed to the Society of the Illuminati. So in other words, he says, I realize there is a danger that this is creeping into our country and into our lodges. He said, but I haven't really been in the lodge uh, for 30 years now. I don't, uh, I don't know of it going on here. Here's his second letter, a follow-up letter to the same individual in which he talks about Illuminism's infiltration of Freemasonry. It was not my intention to doubt that the doctrines of the Illuminati and principles of Jacobinism had not spread in the United States. On the contrary, no one is more truly satisfied of this fact than I am. Apparently, George Washington was coming to the realization for himself that, yes, in fact, this man's concerns were actually well-founded. The idea that I meant to convey was that I did not believe that the lodges of Freemasons in this country had, as societies, endeavored to propagate the diabolical tenets of the first, that is, of Illuminism. That individuals of them may have done it, uh, blah, 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 is too evident to be questioned. In other words, I realize there are those trying to foster this within our country and even within our lodges. So let me ask the question. You and I both know people that are Freemasons. You know some, whether you know you know some or not. So are all Freemasons Illuminists? Are they all Luciferians? Are they all Satanists? The reality is the majority of Masons you and I know know none of what you and I just talked about. Of course all Freemasons are not Illuminists. In fact, the vast majority of Masons do not even know that Illuminism is behind much of what is taught in Freemasonry probably including the Masons that you know personally. Unfortunately, all Freemasons are under the influence of a luminous doctrine, whether they realize it or not, because it has been the basis for all rites, rituals, and symbolism in the lodges for more than 200 years. All Freemasons have been and are being initiated into the mystery religions by their exposure to certain symbols, stories, and unbiblical doctrines. This is intended to change their beliefs, attitudes, and actions. Now, I'm coming to a close here for tonight. I have one more slide. But I want to say that the Masons you and I know, they don't know probably 90% of what I've shared with you tonight. They know all of what I shared with you the first three weeks. They don't know what I've shared with you tonight. They will refute it. They'll deny it because especially those that are still in the first three degrees of the Blue Lodge, they've never heard any of this. They'll tell you, you don't know what you're talking about. And they're good men, I'm sure. Many of them probably Christians. 
But the reality is if they're in the lodge and they're active in Freemasonry, they're still under the influence of these teachings whether they realize they are or not. And the teachings of Illuminism that are in Freemasonry today are antithetical to that book, the Bible. They're coming under the influence of it whether they realize it or not. And it is changing how they think about things. What they believe about things. And here's the final slide for tonight. And here's the reason they're being initiated. Because you're being initiated too without even knowing it. The initiation of the masses. Today pop culture is being used to initiate the masses of humanity into the very same mystery religions, fertility religions, paganism, in order to prepare the way for the coming Antichrist in his one world system. Paganism today is all around us. The symbols are a subtle but extremely effective means of communicating messages subconsciously, even if the individual is consciously unaware of their true meanings. The symbols of Illuminism and pop culture today include apples, serpents, butterflies, owls, the sun, and emblems of male and female reproduction, particularly the male and the mother goddess. These icons that you see up here, these logos you see up here of multinational, international corporations, they're all symbols of Mystery Babylon. They're all symbols of the ancient mystery pagan religions. And uh, to an individual one, I could explain to you how so. I'm not going to do that tonight. We've done that in the past. I'll stick around tonight if you want to ask me a question about any of them. And, uh, but all of those are symbols of that pagan fertility religion of the Tower of Babel. You and I are being initiated in a subtle way by constantly being bombarded with all these symbols. Those in Freemasonry are being initiated in a more direct route. And it is changing how they view things, how they think about things. In the final part of this presentation next week, I'm going to show you how what they're being taught with these false doctrines in the Lodge is changing our country. It's changing our government, our business world, our social structure, and even the churches across America. I'm going to show it to you in as, as uh, finite a way as I can do. I hope you'll be here for next week. I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to stick around, and if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer those too. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for a chance for us to study what the Bible says in comparison to Freemasonry. Lord, help those that are watching or listening to this presentation to understand that we're not against anyone who is a Mason, but we have a desire for those that are genuinely born again to see for themselves that it's not of God. Lord, may you work in their hearts. May you show them the truth if they seek it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.